We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three. Listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is the Finances Podcast, Ben Kemp. Uh, myself, Jay Burke, and today's guest is Tony Slack. Uh, Tony, you're going to help have to help us. We both fumbled over whether it was Geelong Real Estate Advocates or Geelong Advocates Real Estate. Help us out with that. Good question, Jay, and good morning, Ben. Good morning, Jay. Thanks so much for having me on. Looking forward to having a chat with you. Yeah, I think it had something to do with licensing, what was available and how I could word it. So, a bit of a license to Geelong Real Estate Advocates, but yeah, it's Geelong Advocates. That's the registered name yeah but, uh, just say Geelong Real People Estate Advocates pretty yeah. quickly what you do <laughs> yeah. so we, we did a little search beforehand obviously Ben's known you for a number of years but for those out there that don't know you you're a buyer's advocate vendor advocate licensed real estate agent essentially helping home buyers and sellers in Geelong, the Geelong area for something like 34 years is that right gee you've done your research Jay <laughs> I just took yeah. that straight off your Instagram yeah. <laughs> 34 years I know what you're probably thinking when I walked in. Gee, you must have been 12 when you started, <laughs> but I was actually 24. I'd just turned 24. I'd spent a year on Hamilton Island working up there in 1988, and upon my return, it was seriously, I wasn't even thinking what I was going to do next. I came back to Geelong. It was early 1989, and, and a footy mate of mine had just started, got a job with Max Real Estate in Miracle Street, and back then Maxwell Real Estate had four offices, Belmont, Leopold, North Geelong, and Geelong. Is that the prior Peter, to Maxwell Collins? Yes, correct. Yep. yep. Yeah, they amalgamated, I think, in the early 2000s from memory. So he just started there, and I said, oh, real estate. You know, he goes, oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to make heaps of money, and I'm going to get a flash car, and it's really good, and uh, wear a suit, look, you know, look at me in dollars. I've gone, well, gee, if you get a job in real estate, like I might be a chance as well. So he said, oh, he goes, I think they're looking for someone at the North Geelong office. He said, I'll have a chat to my boss, which he did. And uh, Peter Maxwell rang me and, and said, he's a Bell Park boy, Peter, Peter yeah. Maxwell. He rang, he said, oh, he said, are you race lax son? And I said, he said, do you want me to be race lax son? <laughs> uh, depends. Depends. <laughs> depends. He said, uh, no, he said, so you're looking for a job in real estate? I said, well, not particularly, but I've been on Hamilton Island for a year and last year, and I said, you know, be keen to. I've done had some sales experience. Went and had a chat, and he said, oh, you know, when could you start? So out I went, uh, started out there in, in North Geelong in Separation Street. And How old were you then, Tony? 24. Just turned 24, and I honestly, I can still remember the first property I sold was a little unit in Church Street in Hearn Hill, just before the old railway line there near Vines Road. And so I walked in, I met the lady there and she walked, I opened the door and come in, have a look and walked, she walked in, walked around and come out. She goes, she goes, I think I'd like to try and buy it. I said, oh, that's good. She said, so what do I do now? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I, said, I said, if you could, if you could, wouldn't mind following me back to the office. I said, it's only a couple of kilometers away. I said, and I'll ask uh, my boss, which is Mario Gregich. Uh, his son, Joe Gregich, still operates from an office nearby, the Harcourts, they are there. And uh, I remember Joe coming in after school, you know, he was only a, just a little tacker then. And uh, But yeah, he, he was a, a really good, as far as a first boss, from a, a better term, he, he was a great boss, Mario Gregich. He, he taught me, I'd even go as far as to say, if I, if I spent two years there, if I didn't have someone like Mario, I reckon it could have gone either way my career he was a great just a great teacher you know hard hard yeah, but that but, generation you know, that generation yeah. you know croatian he you know knew so many people he, he was shy of, he wasn't mayor but shy of whatever they were of Korea back then so he, he was well known in the in the community good person good family but, but just good you know good values taught me a lot taught me a lot a couple of standouts you know never know when you're being judged i think that was was one that i still remember him saying you know you just don't know who they are. Um, be careful. Uh, loose lip sink ships. That was an, another one where he just said, "You just be careful what you say to people." An example might be, "Oh, you know, I was out with Bill and Betty last week, showing them houses, and you know, I'm about to put their house on the market." Oh, she's my sister. You know, she hasn't told us they're moving. So, just little things like that in real estate. I think you've just got to be really careful, particularly in Geelong. In Geelong, Jay. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they're, they're probably a standout. Just you know, 
take people face value because you just never know who they are and, and just be very, very careful what you say and, and who you say that to. So, yeah. Probably very similar to our, our line of work, or for most people really, isn't it? Yeah. They're respecting that. Well, we started chatting before the live the mics went live and Tony were just talking about the importance of relationships mm. and how nearly every business, the foundation of every business is relationships. And you know, one of my concerns going off topic a little bit was what the next generation of uh, kids are going to look like in the workforce if they don't have the ability to actually gain trust and build long-standing relationships. Where, for you, Tony, so with the risk of going too far back, where was that sort of relationship building ethos? Where did it start? Was it with the guys at Maxwell or did it predate that in your schooling days and your, your upbringing? Yeah, probably all all of those, Jay. Probably, and and just to go on what you were saying, that like I've always said that real estate is, you know, the, the property itself is a byproduct of what the industry is about because it is. It's about trust, relationships. You know, you're dealing with what is most people's greatest asset, financial asset. So I think, unfortunately, over the years, I've seen the change, I suppose, in the real estate agent. It's a bit more about them, become more about the individual agent profile. I think, you know, social media has had a massive impact on, on that. But certainly when I first started, I remember clearly because I, I went to Geelong West Tech. I'm only great, school, great, great school, great school. I know. Yeah, you put it on the map, Jay, and uh, <laughs> you, you uh, did before me. <laughs> <laughs> I was not a great student, I can assure you. So I've only got year ten education, and and I did an apprenticeship as a baller maker four years. And but what I reckon once again, where I started in real estate was in the northern suburbs. Okay, so you know Bell Park, Bell Post Hill, you know working class, blue collar, Corio, Norlane. That was my patch. So. I was always very aware of, I'd wear a suit. Real estate, you wear a suit. Quite often I'd pull up at the front. Now, another thing, I'd bought, just to go back, so my first 12, 18 months of real estate, I drove a bright red Ford Laser with Queensland number plates. <laughs> with this Tony Slack, fly-by-night real estate. <laughs> so it used to get a lot of comments, you know, what's with the Queensland number plates? And, oh, I worked in Queensland for a year, man. I bought a car when I got off the island, and but I was always conscious that you turn up, you know, I was a baller maker, so you turn up at, at a, you know, an owner's home, and you got a pretty good sense of the type of people they were, even by talking to them on the phone prior. So I was always conscious. I didn't want to ruck up there in the suit. I'd take my tie off. I'd roll my sleeves up. G'day, mate. How, how are you, mate? Great to see you. So you know, once again, you're building that. Hey, well, he's just like me. Because let's face it, most of I don't know about you guys, but most of my friends are exactly like me. You know, very rarely do you have mates that are you know polar opposites. And I reckon there's a lot about in business as well, where I think people, if they can relate to you, feel comfortable with you, on the same page, I think you've got a far you know a better working relationship than if you're poles apart in your, in your thinking, in your views, if your personalities. So I think once again, from a very early stage in my career, it was about being relatable to my clients. Yeah, being the real deal as well. Yeah, yeah. people can tell if you're genuine or not pretty quickly. Uh, quickly. <laughs> you know, we tell that with people. You can yeah. tell with people all the yeah. time in whatever yeah. they're doing. So yeah, yeah. And Jay's here in a t-shirt, so he's, he's yeah. really he's uh, real. gone. These he's as real there. as you can get. He's as comfortable <laughs> as he can be. So that's Friday. Right, right. Giving away the suits yeah. many years ago now. But if you had guns like Jay, you'd be wearing, you'd be yeah, wearing thanks, t-shirts Tony. all the yeah. time. It's, it did coincide with that when he started to hit the gym that he started wearing t-shirts. <laughs> that's right. Enough about. Me. We're here to talk about Tony. <laughs> One of the things we failed to talk about right at the start for those people that are hearing you for the first time, Tony, is listen, let's talk about what an advocate actually is. So we've yeah. heard a little bit about your background, where you sort of entered the industry. Let's talk about when you made the transition from real estate per se into property and real estate advocacy and what is advocacy. Yeah, yeah, sure. I reckon like it was something that I'd thought about doing for a while, Joe, because after being a sales agent for 20-odd, 23-odd years, I was doing more helping for a bottle of wine, you know. Hey, Tony, can you come and bid for us at auction? Can you come and have a look at this house that's listed with one of your competitors? You know, can you find out a bit about this? And, and so you try and explain, look, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get on with Jay and Ben because they're my competition. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to help you because they're probably not going to help tell me much at all, you know, because I'm their competition. 
same when you rock up at auction, you're a competitor. Sort of, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, what's he doing? You know, he's trying to do us over, is he? You know, what's going on? So I was always conscious that you know, I wanted to help people, but you're conflicted because you're working as a sales agent, you're a competitor. So it used to jar on me. I'd go, look, I'd love to help you, but, you know, I just don't think it's going to be that much benefit. I'm happy to give you advice how to go about doing it, but I, I just don't think I can actually hand, hold your hand and walk you through this property because they're probably not going to give me anything. In the actual fact, they might resent the fact that I'm here and it might reflect on you. And I said, so they might put a line through you, so it, it actually might work out you know, detrimental for me to have some involvement. So the more I thought about it, I could see advocacy starting to you know, become, I wouldn't say norm, but you know, a bit more prevalent in Melbourne. So I you know, jumped on their websites, had a look, and, and I thought, you know what, Like, it, I think it, it could take off. It could be okay. What kind of time frame was this? What year was this when you 2011. started? 2011. Okay. So 2011. The market was going along pretty well. So you are at Barry um, Plant. I was at Barry Plant yep. at, at that stage. And look, I don't mind telling you, like I felt at that stage I was, you know, presenting – when I, you know, hey, we're thinking of selling and go and have a chat and so forth. So I thought, you know, I was putting to the owners a pretty compelling reason why I was the best agent for the job. And I, I'd never missed as much business in my life. And it, and it starts to really play on you. Like, it, you know, your confidence and you think, what am I doing wrong? You know, they sent us flowers, you know, after they came through and we, and the, we got some champagne. And this was happening more and more often. I'm going, these other agents, they're buying the business before they've even got the business. They're giving them incentives, inducements to list with me and vouchers, meal vouchers, dinner vouchers. You know, thanks for having us out to your house. Here's a voucher. So I'd say, well. Sounds like soft know, dollar benefits to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that, and, and it was. And, and I, I just felt that I was losing business to agents that, that I felt weren't at my level. Uh, that doesn't sound too arrogant, but, you know, agents that had been in the, real, in the game for 15 minutes. You know, fees played a big part in that as well, where, oh, they said they were going to do it for 1%. And I'm just going, well, okay. If they're prepared to give their own money away just like that, what are they going to do when they get hold of your money? You know, so if that's what you're basing your decision on, I'm not your agent. So all the best with the sale. Good luck. Goodbye. So that was another probably catalyst for, I just thought, you know what? might be time to, to try something new, something different. As an agent, were you in that period of time around 2011 when you started to see advocacy sort of popping up in Melbourne? Did you ever have a, a confrontation, is probably not the right word, but were you presented with a sales where you were the agent and you had advocates on the other side? That's always been a conflict where, you know, you can either be looking for, you're either an a sales agent working for the vendor or you're either a buyer's agent representing the, the vendor. And so... I've always prided myself on having really good working relationships with, with sales agents. I think if I'm butting heads with agents, I'm not helping my clients one bit. So I've always prided myself on good, open relationships. I'm always respectful. I, I was in their shoes for 23 years. I know what their position is, and hopefully they understand my position as well. And at the end of the day, you're only, you, you want a win-win outcome. You, you know, I think most of my clients, you know, did you, you have any, them, did you have any negative experiences with advocates when you were an agent? I don't think I dealt with. I, okay. I, sorry, no, sorry, I did. I dealt with one, and with the greatest respect, they didn't have a real estate background. And once again, I think that we can perhaps talk about this a bit further later on. But unless you've walked in the shoes of a real estate agent, experienced what it's like to sell, represent vendors. And to buy as well, like, you know, I used to say, I think nearly the number one criteria for a sales agent, have you been a vendor? Have you, you know, you're representing vendors, have you been in their shoes? Have you sold a property? Do you really know what it's like to experience the... So the, the emotion that goes on that side of it, then, yeah. The, I think there's plenty in with the advocates now, they're sort of popping up, aren't they? It, it became a bit of a market. Ooh, ooh, yeah, that watching sounds the, pretty fun. I can the, spend someone else's money. Watching and a block. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they think it's just this high roller sort yeah, of uh, yeah. experience, I'm sure, again, yeah. from speaking to you over the years. There's, there's advocates and advocates like there's agents and agents and, mm. you know, in every industry. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and so, so if you're taking advice from – be careful who you're taking advice from as long as they don't have to live with the consequences. Be, well, be careful taking advice from people that don't have to live with the consequences. And I think it's, you know, I, I don't want to say too much, but there's been plenty of examples over the years where I've seen agents 
from outside the region, advocates, I should say, from outside the region, giving advice to paying clients, and they're paying them considerable amount of money for advice. The buyer's agents haven't even been to that suburb before. I think there was that run where they were coming down the, the highway from Melbourne and the client would say, I've got X amount of budget and they would go and buy something. They might have paid 200 over what it was probably worth, but they still had 200 left in their budget, so they were happy. Correct. And they charged them a fortune for it, which yep. blew that market up. That, yep. That to, corrupted the, the reputation to, of those advocates. So, correct. And others correct. without... Correct. And I know I might be talking out of school a bit, but I don't care. But <laughs> um, I've had agents that have actually said, sales agents that have said to me, they couldn't believe how they didn't put up a fight. It was like, what's going to buy it? That price. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, because they weren't getting paid till they That's, did the deal. Correct. Yeah. As I say to every one of my clients right from the outset, I want to make sure you don't pay $1 more than you need to. Simple. And it's not about doing over the agent, doing over the vendor, just... We want to make sure that you don't throw away your money. It's better off that extra thousand, two thousand, ten, twenty thousand dollars is better in your pocket than the vendors because that's what I'm paid to do. You have to be careful. Sometimes you walk a fine line between being successful in buying the property and then letting it slip within your grasp because you're playing too hardball. Okay, and that and that's often I remind my clients that if we poke the bear for want of a better, you know, if we get offside with the vendor, if we get offside with the agent, they're going to put a line through us. If they think we're playing too hard ball, we don't want to deal with them. And let's face it, the vendor can sell their property to whoever they want yep. for whatever amount of money they want. I think some people think they have to be this like hard-edged yep. negotiator in yep. there. <laughs> yeah, very rarely, Ben, does that approach work. There are agents, that, sales agents, that clearly give away their vendor's position on price. Give me that money, give me that price, I'll get it done. Often that is 10% under what my clients are prepared to pay and I haven't even had to open my mouth. And it's like I ring the bank and go, guess what they've just told me? Yeah. Pay that and it's ours. You're kidding me. Nope. Loose lips sink ships. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's incredible, you know, and, and then they'll go and plaster on, you know, Facebook, Instagram, that how great are we, you know, great result and testimonial from the vendor, you know, my agent was so good, they got us this price and I'm going, but they left a hundred grand on the table. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah so uh, anyway, back to the, the Ford laser. <laughs> so that was, I think, you know, a really good instilled in me that people, what's there's a saying? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I would like to think that I've always run real estate business like that. Go in and find out what it is that you're wanting to try and achieve. Like a doctor, you know, diagnose and then prescribe. What is it that you want to achieve? Whether that's selling, whether it's buying, what is it you want to achieve? And look, you know, this is how I think you should go about it and they either accept that yeah that's you know i don't have all the answers i don't always get it right not at all a lot of nearly everything that i i do and have done i've learned from others simple you know from day one mario gregic you know and, and then eight years at jen's court literally 200 meters from where we're sitting you know i spent eight years at, in packing street with a really good firm and, and, you know, with really good agents, you know, learning from them and, you know, obviously the good and the bad and everything in between and, you, you know, being what you think, that's just not, that's not, that's not me. And your own style, you know, it's like auctioneering, you know, you have different styles and uh, so many different type of auctioneers out there and I've done a bit of training with a lot of agents over the years and, you know, say so you never, you never want to be a little clone, you want to, put your own spin on it and own flair and, you know, because once again, you're paid to represent the vendor out there on the street and you should be doing whatever you possibly can to drag every last dollar out of the bidders. And I think that went by the wayside during the peak that we've just had. I think, with all respect, a lot of those auctioneers were just number takers, you know. They, they really didn't have to work the broom, for want of a better term. They didn't really have to work the buyers that hard. Or, or, or the Zoom. The yeah, Zoom, yeah, that's yeah. right. During COVID, that's right. So... You know, I don't underestimate, I know we're getting off track here a bit, but, you know, the ability, oh, well, I suppose with that, the ability of your agent to your sales agent, the influence that they can have on the outcome, I've seen it, I know it, it can be considerable amount of money. If you have the best agents representing you in your corner fighting for you, they can make the difference of 
tens and tens of thousands of dollars because I'd like to think I'm pretty well qualified to see how the better agents operate and the ones that are just that poor. And some of them just want to get a sale, That's ultimately, don't they? Them, yeah. I know from speaking yeah. to you over the years, and you sort of indicated you see an agent listed and you go, oh, well, <laughs> great, you might this be a good out. This is pretty good. You know, yeah. you know that they're not going to be too yeah. Yeah. hung up on squeezing an yeah. extra little bit out because yeah. they'll be happy to yep. sign the docs and move on yeah. to the next one. Yeah. And look, you know, once again, it's it's something you. I often remind my clients, my buyer clients, that there will be, whether we like it or not, there will be instances where a sales agent will have a bias over a buyer, okay? And that might be friend, it could be colleague, it could be someone who has a house to sell. And so once again, they've got an added incentive to ensure that that particular purchaser secures the property so often i'll say is look you know we might be entering into this negotiation with one hand tied behind our back we could be at a disadvantage because this agent has got a bias towards another potential buyer that point kind of suggests why having advocacy and actually understanding Ending. where that bias exists mm-hmm. like for the the average individual out there not having any relationship with agents or not understanding the landscape having understanding about where people have biases and what agents do have biases mm. has got to be one of the better advantages or the greater advantages of having advocacy when you're going to the table. Yeah, I'd like to think so, Jay. I've said for a long, long period of time that the questions that you ask anybody, whether they're using a buyer's agent, but it really important questions to ask agents. And if you ask the average home buyer, you know, what are really valid quality questions you should be asking of a real estate agent, the majority wouldn't want to ask, you know, how much will they take? That's normally, you know, I actually say in nearly every instance to an agent is let's put price to one side for a moment. Other than price, what is it that, like I was saying before, what is it that your owners are trying to achieve here? Where are they going? What are they doing? What's their timelines? What's important other than price? What's the second most important thing to them? And and you'll find not always is price, you know, price is important, but it's not always everything. And that's about, once again, I like to think that, you know, trying to get my clients an advantage is having these discussions around other things other than just price. Because I've had plenty of people over the years go, oh, we offer them this and we prepare to give them 21 day settlement and 20% deposit and this, but that was not even, you know, it was water off a day. Back because so how, of, how do some of those non-financial influences help you? Timeline. So yeah. timeline. I'll give you an example. So say, say if a client, let's just say an investor client comes and says, "Hey, we've got some interest in this property. This is really, really good. I think we'd like to try and move forward." And I'll say to the agent, well, "Okay, you know, price to one side. What are you? Oh, well, they're building. They're building a house, and uh, you know, a few delays, and so they're going to be going into a rental." Uh, rental situation okay yeah and they got you know the payments so they really need to get the, you know hold of some cash quickly to make their installments and so forth so you go okay all right well how about this you know we can give them six months rent free what six months rent free yeah we'll give them 30 percent deposit and you know what they can access that under what's called a section 27 early deposit release so they can get their hands on that oh what's the catch tony Oh, well, it'll be at this price. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I'll put it to them. Invariably, I'll come back and go, hey, yeah, sure, it's not exactly the price, but an open-ended month by month, you know. Um, you met our other needs. You met our other needs. You know, get our hands on the money, quick settlement, you know, all those things. But, yeah, sure, you know, the price, well, the price reflects that we're giving them, as you said, Jay, we're giving them those other things that are important to them as well. So... Not always about price. And if you can find out where, what people are doing, where they're at, uh, how can we facilitate them without, you know, the double move, without the, you know. I think those no pr- one wants to do that, do they? The double no, move. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Those practical examples are awesome because yeah. they actually, again, let you sort of, they part the curtain a little bit and yeah. let you have a look behind the scenes at what is going to influence a deal. Yeah. Have you got any others that come to mind? Any other sort of non-financial influences that sometimes can help in getting a deal done? Well, there's a lot. And I, I say everyone that's selling has a different 
set of circumstances. You know, it could be financial, could be they're upgrading another home, they're bought elsewhere and so forth. So there's probably, I mean, there's so many, Jay, that variables when it does come to selling, you know, properties. Uh, it's just simply you're trying to be as accommodating as you possibly can. Sometimes it's on the other foot, like where my buyer might have, might purchase a client, they had, may have sold their home. So they've got a settlement date of the 19th of May. Go to the agent. You know, what's the chances of getting settlement on the 19th of May? Not happening. Okay. Why? For whatever reason. Okay. All right. Go back to the client. They're saying 19th of May not happening. Oh, you're kidding. You know, what do we need to do? (laughs) What do we need to do to try and... And so that's when, for my client, it's more the 19th of May, then the table's turned what if we give them a, is there something else we can give them, you know? So you go back, cap in hand, well, Jay, look, we really need settlement 19th of May. What is it that could possibly help to get them to agree to that? Oh, well, if you pay that and give them, you know, throw, throw in a slab of beer. There's always a way. There's always, there's always, always a pr- Everything's got a price. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I think so, the, the, the key being that you've got to yeah. understand Yes. What's actually going to motivate yeah. people in the first place? place. Yeah. I was just thinking you could probably fill a fill a role in just about any any industry that required mediation. Mm. Yeah, because that's what say, you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you're doing, Jay. And it's quite often. No, I only need a, a next colleague of mine end up being a, a psychologist, and he used to use psychology on people. And I'd often walk and go, you, "You're how? Where did that come from?" And you just made so much sense. And he just had a natural ability. He was a great agent, and he worked really hard for his clients. He just had the ability to be able to, you know, once again, give people options and look, I understand where you're from. And, you know, if you don't allow me to do this, 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 how can I help you? And it was like, I go, how good is he? He's convinced them. He's made a compelling reason that if you don't allow me to do A, B and C, I can't look you in the eyes and say, I've done everything I possibly can to get you the best result. And he, he would do that time and time again where, you know, he, he was relentless in ensuring that they agreed to give him every opportunity to get the best result. Because if you leave one of those things off, when you say to me, oh, now, Tony, do you think we could do better? Well, I don't know, because you haven't let me do this. So I can't categorically say you've got the best result because we've left a fairly key component out of the the whole equation. So a bit of psychology. um, Psychology, experience, relationships, and bundling all of those together. (laughs) It, uh, you didn't become an overnight success overnight, Tony. Well, I was going to say, when I started that, we, we, I know we've sort of darted and weaved a little bit, but when I started advocacy, I'm more than happy to, to share this with you. Peter Farrago is, a, is the editor of the Geelong Advertiser. He was good enough to give me a, a weekly column in the Addy, and he reached out to me. I mean, he saw what I was doing. He said, this is great. He said, it's all always been something that he'd, he'd considered doing is getting an, an industry person to do a do a weekly column. He said, but I was struggling because conflicted. You know, I, I, it was hard for me to go to a, a sales agent at a particular company because then, you know, I might go to Ben Riddle and do a weekly column and then, you know, John Moran from Whitford rings up and says, what's going on? You know, how come he's doing the weekly column, you know? So he said, this is really good. He said, because you're independent. And he said, you can talk about whatever you like. You're not going to offend anyone because you're independent. So he gave me a really good leg up, for want of a better term, starting my business. But it was tough going. And, you know, I got had a mortgage, bills to pay, kids to put through school and, and the like. So I sat down, I've gone, this is not sustainable. I'm, I'm not making enough money here. So I got a job, part-time job, driving a truck. 5.30 a.m., I'd get out of bed, get to the depot in Duro Street in North Geelong, jump in the truck, uh, head to Tullamarine, come back, do a couple of trips, drop-offs along the way, come back and then do a return trip you know, a couple of hours later, a couple of local deliveries, and then I'd go back to Tullamarine lunchtime, late morning lunchtime, drop-off, and then come back to Geelong Depot, clock off, come home. So I did that for about two years, two and a half years, five days a week. And yeah, that, you know, just to put food, just to keep, you know, keep a bit of financial pressure off. I could still talk while I was driving the truck. <laughs> so I couldn't make, I had, I had every Wednesday off. Yeah, so four days a week I was doing that, had every Wednesday off. And, but, you know, I'd be home by one o'clock in, on most days. So I could, you know. Did you always think so that forth. the advocacy stuff would, 
take over or do you a bit yeah. were you unsure? Yeah, plenty of times unsure, Ben. Yeah. Plenty of times because, you know, you just, you know, you have your website, you, and people, you know, have business cards and talk to people. And, and really, I didn't, I got very little, you know, direct business from my col- weekly column in the Addy. Did that for the best part of two years, the, the column. Yeah, nearly two years doing that. So I was, it was just an awareness. And then you try and get around to as many properties, auctions, open for inspections. And, you know, it slowly, slowly, it was, it was more, you know, well, why would I pay? you know, for a service that I can do myself. And still to this day, by and large, you know, the majority of my clients were from outside the region for that very reason. Like, we don't know Geelong, got no idea. So, hey, you're on the ground. You know, obviously, you've been around for a while. I think you could help us. So, so what is the reluctance of people that are from the region to secure an advocate? I just feel that they think they can do it themselves. Why would I pay someone to do something I can do. How hard is it to rock up at an auction and throw my hand in the air? So, so what is it that they don't understand? They don't, they don't understand the role of the sales agent, simple, okay. who's paid by the vendor. They And with all respect, they credit their negotiating ability above people who are doing it for their living, day in, day out. In nearly every real estate company that I worked in, I was fortunate enough in most of the firms I worked with, I worked with some top flight agents, exceptionally good agents, and we would do in-house training weekly. Scripts, dialogues, role play, like everything. And negotiation was nearly the number one on the list to practice, rehearse, how to go about negotiating to get every last dollar out of the buyer. So you don't just get lucky with that stuff. It's a skill. It 100%. 100%. I'd read on negotiating. I, for two years, two and a bit years, I went completely the other way where I worked under what was back then known as the Genman system. You may or may not have heard of the Genman system. So I was working here in town for the professionals and Leighton Kidman, who had a real estate well-known agent over in the, in the South Barn region, said that they were completely upturning their business and I was an agent who had done a lot of auctions. I did my first auction. I've been in real estate three years, four years. I did my first auction. So I was a big auction agent, open for inspections. That, that was just like many as open for inspections as I could do any weekend because in my mind, that was how you came face-to-face with more people. You know, get out there, open the houses, face-to-face with people, build your business that way. Paid advertising. I remember, you know, back in the Jens Gaunt days, back when the advertiser was the broadsheet, so the same size as the Australian newspaper is today. You and wouldn't remember we, that, Ben. No, Ben, before, before, my time. before your time. And Ben, it was black and white. There's no <laughs> colour. So we made a conscious decision, we being my bosses, made a conscious decision to commit to a full page in the advertiser every week, every week except Christmas, New Year, commit to full, full on full page. So we had to fill it, all right? So we, we were you know, advised, directive was, hey, listen, you know, promote the properties, spend your, your client's money, not our money, spend your client's money on advertising. So that was always what, what was inbuilt into me and like promote the property, market it, push it, open for inspection, auction, great method of sale, auction, auction, auction. So I got a call from Blake and Kidman. He said, Tony, he said, do you want to come and have a chat to us? I said, yeah, what about? And he said, we've got a position here you think you might be able to fill. So long and the short of it, I basically did went from doing auctions, opens, vendor paid advertising to private sale only, no open for inspections, no vendor paid advertising. And I'll go, oh, I'm sitting there, and I reckon I was six months in, and I'm going, oh, what the hell have I done here? <laughs> Actually, I reckon it might have been six weeks in. <laughs> so I was out at the Warpond Shopping Centre, First National was the firm. And, but I'll tell you what, it was quite possibly two and a half, three years of the best time in real estate, strangely enough. Because it forced you to 100%. rely on your skills? 100%, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's like anything, if you truly believe that that is the best way forward for your client and can build a compelling reason why for you, Specifically, and let's face it, that was a market, you know, Grovedale, Warm Ponds, Height, and Belmont back then. It wasn't a traditional auction market. So I, that probably helped. And back then, too, once again, we, you know, a levy, you don't, no sale, no charge. That was for a lot of people, oh, you beauty, no risk. Yeah. And this is circa sort of 99, Spot 2003. On. Spot on. Yep. Yep. Around that time, Jay. So 
you know, people, that was, oh, no, sell no fee. That's really good, really. Oh, no, lose. Where do we sign? Guaranteed. We give them a guarantee. You know, we do all these things here and for them and tick, 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 tick. And if we fail to do any of these things, you can sack us. No, you know, no, nothing. Oh, that gives us peace of mind. You know, we can sack you any time. Yep. Yep, if I don't live up to these 25 points, you can sack me. Oh, oh, oh quick, give me the pen. Yeah. <laughs> we sign. And so, but it did, it kept you accountable, absolutely, um, really accountable. You had to, relationships, you know, you just didn't rock up at a house and open it and hope someone turned up. So, you, you, you know, you were told you had to meet them at the office. This was how you had to go about it. Meet them at the office, come in. We were open seven days a week, so I think we were the first office then to open seven days a week. I reckon we even opened. I reckon we were seven o'clock at night. I reckon we were seven days a week till seven o'clock at night. Maybe not Sundays. So that once again a good like I was reluctant, but when same thing, he made Leighton made a compelling reason why he felt that he was far more experienced than me and very successful. I think it's like anything. If you think, well, he's no deal, you know, there must be something in there. If he's prepared to. He didn't sack his staff, but he advised a lot of his staff that time was up and this was the way forward and if they didn't want to do this, see you later, and they all got up and left. Just to get a bit adapt, I remember talking to you during COVID and I think we were looking to purchase a place and it was in the time of online auctions or, you know, where some of them were Zoom format and all different things and you'd said, yeah, I've been watching them online. I've been watching the recordings of these online auctions in Melbourne just to get an idea of how they operate, what's what's the way to go about and things. And you're still sort of just drilling your skills on this alternative format, format. that you had to adapt yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. And again, you couldn't just roll in and think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah. You were still think- <laughs> looking at all these options and seeing how it works and trying to get your head around it. Yeah, and it still came back to the same base of negotiations people and closing that out but you had to work out what's the best way to approach these things and i think i said to you at the time ben i haven't, I haven't even bought anything on ebay yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, so but yeah you just work through and i think if, if you truly believe like you guys in your industry if you truly believe that this is you know we've done our research we've been doing it a long time you know we compare compare apples with apples and apples with pears and we we believe that this is the best way for you the individual client because I'm always really mindful of never having a one-size-fits-all approach. No different than you guys, okay? Because every client, different age, different financial position. Preferences. Preferences, family, that's right. Influences. Those influences, yeah, influences yeah. All, those, all those things. Exactly. So I'm always really conscious of that. Where I'll go is, well, okay, what I suggest and advise Jay may not necessarily be right for Ben. So that's why I'm saying about the, you know, diagnose and prescribe. Not every sales agent, but, you know, there's a lot of a lot of agents that will just go, this is the way to do it. It's my way or it's the highway, you know, like, and without a lot of consideration for their, um, for their clients. So yeah, that's what I've always tried to pride myself on is doing what is best for the individual client. Maybe rolling that into what's sort of happening in the market at the moment and it's again the last – let's call it 12, 18 months, has obviously been a bit of a change in that approach and there was that period where, like you said earlier, you could just throw a house up on auction, people would turn up, five or six or eight or ten people would throw their hand in the air and it was happy days. The market starts to tighten up and probably the real, the really good agents get, you know, that's where you find out who's working the best for their client and adapting to those things. What are you seeing in the market at the moment? Is it starting, is the supply sort of dropped off a little bit? You were maybe saying earlier it's starting to increase again. What's your feeling for it and people buying at the moment, what they have to be a bit cautious of? First bit of advice I can give to, let's first start with buyers, yep. okay? Don't read too much into the headlines. That's the best bit of advice I can give you. A lot of the data, a lot of the you know reporting is being done from Sydney, being done by analysts who have never been to Geelong. So first bit of advice Speak to those who are working in your specific, wherever your target area, if you're looking at buying in whatever part of Geelong, the region, whether it's Ballerine, Surf Coast, City of Greater Geelong, Golden Plains, talk to the people who are on the ground, living it, breathing it, what's going on. I always said an agent, area specialists, the best agents are the area specialists, the ones that ideally live in the market place that they're working 
kids at the school, shopping, all that. They're on the ground. They know what's going on. I'm a stickler for, for going on the City of Greater Geelong planning website, planning applications. I would go on twice a week just to see what's going on. I've said to people, have you been on the, you know, the City of Greater Geelong planning website? No, what, what's that? Well, jump on. See what's going on. You know, it's amazing how much you can learn you know, about what developments are going on in Geelong just by jumping on that. It's, it's really, really good. But just talking to you guys, you're in the, here you are in the center of Geelong, the epicenter of Geelong. Pack Western the Street. Yeah. Pack goes the center. <laughs> the center now. It, it is. is. It Absolutely, it is. Yeah. Particularly with the growth out west. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, just to know what's going on is just so important. Developments is just, you know, really, really important. And then, Expanding upon that, you know, the housing market. What's the mood of the market? What is the mood of the buyers? What's the sentiment of the buyers in the market? Sellers sell for every different reason. There'll be some that will go, hey, we think that the market's peaked. We're going to cash in. We're going to cash out on this property because we feel that nothing other than money, financial gain, that's the number one criteria for them to be selling all the way through to death, divorce, financial uh, hardship, upgrading, downsizing. It, there's so many reasons, myriad of reasons why people decide to sell their home. And I think days are gone where they go, oh, we're going to wait till spring because the sun's out. I, I think those days are gone. Used to be. People used to still be really, say it. Yeah. Yeah. People still, I often have clients go, oh, we'll think in spring. That's meant to be the best time, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Go and talk to someone. You can make your grass green. You can paint your grass green <laughs> yeah. so yeah. it looks good in, uh, in the winter. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I used to say, look, you know, if you, get, if you are thinking of spring, make sure that you do it sooner, you know, early spring because – in a perfect world, when you're selling your home, you want to be selling in isolation. You don't want to be selling with heaps of other competition, like houses like yours, you know. So, you know, it's probably not a good idea to – because they, you know, a lot of rightly or wrongly, buyers buy when they're ready to buy, just like sellers. But you don't get buyers look out the window and go, oh, it's only going to be 16 degrees today, showers expected. I think we'll stay indoors today. I don't think we'll go and check that house out down the road. We'll just wait until it warms up a bit. But buyers buy when they're ready. Are you seeing at the moment a predominant reason for people going to market? Is there something that's dominating the market at the moment as to why people are selling? Jay, I think from what I've experienced, I think that there is still a fair bit of that, hey, listen, we've done well out of the property last few years. It might be negligible growth over the next couple of years. So, you know, maybe let's just do it now. The few vendors that I've helped even this year, their circumstances have been so varied. I mentioned the so one, we've got one, that, one at the moment with that you were helping yes, for me, which again, it's just a there you go. aged care lady moving aged into aged care. care. And again, yep. that's just, yep. yeah, that's just, it is that's what right. it is. When it is that happens, it it's time for the property to be sold. Correct. Generally. Correct. Correct. I think, I think the concern, if you're listening to the media and you're thinking about interest rates, the concern is that. What's on the horizon is that potentially a lot more people going to market under that hardship yeah. constraint or or being pushed down that path. What's your view in that of that in terms of what's happening with interest rates? Yep. Great question, Jay. And to our listeners, I would say this. Do whatever you can to keep your property. Do whatever you can within reason, okay? Because the alternatives – Private rental, the private rental market is the most obvious alternative, okay? And it's the tightest rental market that I've experienced in my 34 years. There is just so few rental properties available, and I can make comment about a few of the reasons why that is, the changes to the minimum standards the state government made to the minimum standards. Whilst you know it, it had merit, I think they went too far in – insisting that improvements were made on properties to meet these minimum standards. And what it did was it forced, I think it's wrong, I think I'm pretty well qualified to say that the most of my investor clients that I help buy are mum and dad investors. Simple. Most of them only have one investment property and probably will only ever have one investment property. They're not wealthy people. They're setting themselves up for some you know, financial freedom, in retirement, you know, hopefully having a positively geared property at some point in time, the property will go from a negatively geared investment to a positively geared investment so they can enjoy some income off that property in retirement. What it did was 
it forced people who didn't have a lot of money to make improvements on their property. By and large, a lot of those homeowners had seen really good growth. So what it did, it fast forwarded their decision, fast forwarded, is that a real word? It's sped, sped up. Close it's sped up. It sped up. <laughs> well, no. We knew what you meant. <laughs> it, sped, it sped up their decision to cash in. Let's get out of it. So what we saw is during the peak is a lot of those properties being purchased by Iron Rocky Pass. They didn't care. Oh, we don't need to make these improvements because, you know, we can move in, put our feet up. I'm sure, it's a bit rough around the edges, but hey, we'll right. make an interest rates for low. Interest rates so they were low. Were easy, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So what I've personally found, and I think you've talked to most people in the industry, is that there hasn't been a lot of investors enter the market for a number of years, and especially now. You know, hand on heart, I the vast majority of my clients at the moment own occupiers. So we're seeing it's a double-edged sword. So we've seen a lot of this rental stock, houses, properties that were investment properties, rental properties, they've gone out of the market and turned into owner-occupier properties. We're seeing less investors buying and we are seeing more and more tenants than we are buyers for the obvious reasons. Money's not as cheap as it used to be. So their alternative is, well, we can't afford to buy, we're renting. And you only need to drive past a lot of these rental properties that are open for inspection during the midweek and Saturdays to see the line out the door. I was going to um, say that. I drove down the other day, I was driving near my place and there was a huge line of people. And if you go back two years, that would, I would have thought, oh, my house must have just gone on the market <laughs> for, sale. for sale. But there's a yeah. house that just went to auction on the weekend, passed in, and there was literally, I saw two people go in and every time it was open, yeah. didn't even sell. And the rental little unit down the road has got a queue with 50 people in it lining up to get looked at. Ben, it's completely flipped. That's my point. Yeah. And so that's, Jay, I'd say to, to those, you know, that may be finding, you know, gee, the, the mortgage is, 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 you know, jumped up considerably. So is mine. I, I share share your, your pain in that regard. So, we're you know, no one's immune to, you know, high, higher interest rates. But, I, you know, I'd, I'd be suggesting you just do whatever you possibly can to keep your property. I'd like to think there's blue skies on the horizon. But Without holding holding you to it, yeah. with your your forecast, your projection, we know you're not Nostradamus, but uh, what do you think the next two to three years is going to hold or even shorter time Short frame time. if you want to narrow it down a little? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think our, our property market still, and this is why we saw such – Incredible growth. We we saw probably ten years of growth. Geelong market. I used to say, I've always said Geelong market didn't really ever have any peaks and troughs. I'm old enough to remember the pyramid when Pyramid Building Society in recession in the early nineties. Since then, it's really just been slow and steady. It might just plateau. It might just you know spike a little and then plateau. Spike a little bit, plateau. Just very slow and steady and, and, and somewhat of a predictable type market. There's never peaks and troughs like perhaps some capital cities and, and other regions. But we saw just exceptional unseen growth during, you know, post-COVID, even during COVID, post-COVID there. I, I'd go as far as to say, yeah, we, we probably saw 10 years of growth in five, maybe three, four years. We saw 10 years of growth. It was just incredible. It was like... You know, within a six-month period, what you were paying eight hundred thousand dollars for anywhere, suddenly you're paying nine hundred thousand for. It just happened, blink of an eye. Some of the some of the gains that I experienced firsthand and saw from a distance was just nothing short of phenomenal. You know, that's still a and, and human behaviour. Human behaviour played so much in some of the results, whether it was nerves at auction. Ill advice. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out, Jay. All of those things. And as you said, Ben, when money was, you know, just so cheap, it was like, oh, well, it's only an extra hundred bucks a month. Ah, we can manage that. Now it's probably 400. <laughs> yep. That's right. That's right. So, so going back to our market, I, I think, I feel that we're okay because of where we are and because of our, we talk about sustainability. We talk about affordability. I still think if you, if you ask, Average resident in Geelong, what they're paying on their mortgage, I think it's still okay. And that's what I'm saying about the alternative. You know, sure, if it's twice as much as what you're going to be able to rent a property for, well, yeah, maybe it's time you, you got out. 
But by and large, I'd like to think that, you know, most people, the average mortgage is probably in line with what you are going to have to pay for reasonably neat and tidy rental property. So I'd be saying hang in there. The, certainly there's more people still wanting to come to Geelong than are leaving Geelong. I know that for a fact. You know, those that are selling, I would imagine the majority of them will be moved, still staying in the region. So I think there's a mass exodus up to Gold Coast or... Byron Bay. It's a bit expensive up in Byron yeah, as well. That's right. So when you look at what you know, what underpins our housing market, the obvious, you know, lifestyle, schools, schooling, you know, we're really well placed. You know, I wouldn't say we're, you know, recession proof or anything like that, but I just think that, you know, great community, great place to live, uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, government, state and federal money seems to be filtering down this way. So, no, I think we're really well placed. As I said, just back to a more of a normal market, just slow and, slow and steady. I think, sure, there's been a correction, but not every property. I mean, there's been some results recently. That, you know, there was one that Whitford sold in Myers Street there last Saturday in East Geelong, you know, that you know, that, that price wouldn't have, that wouldn't have been a surprise 18 months ago. So, that, you know, same price today, and you sort of go, wow, wow, you know, but hang on, you know, that's normal, but deserve that price. So I think, I think all, all you need as a buyer is, to, you know, it's validation that, well, okay, maybe things aren't, um, aren't as bad as what we're reading in the paper and hearing on the news. Don't read too much into as a buyer. Don't, you know, don't let, if you're turning up at a property and you're only seeing, as you said, been a couple of people, don't, let that influence you too much. I think, as you said, Jay, about the fear of missing out, I think what everyone will become accustomed to is going to open for inspections and auctions and seeing 80 people. But that's not the case. I think you find that it's back to, I talk often about quality over quantity. I think you find that it's fair to say, I mean, let's face it, real estate was a favourite pastime for a lot of people there for a long time. It's like, just go out and, and see, you know, people felt good, you know, you know their houses felt so much wealthier because, oh, the one just around the corner, that sold for yeah. $2 million. So our house now, that's worth more. And, and I get it. I understand that. And it's like people don't want to go and look at a house that passes in and there's no love, no bids, and they come home and go, oh, gee, you know, no one probably want to buy our house either. So just, yeah, maybe yeah, don't read too much into um, into even what you see when, you, when you're perhaps driving past these auctions and see it passed in and there's not many people there. That's no... Not a true reflection because I can say once again I, you know, I haven't got a, a large client base at the moment, but I can tell you, you know, the quality of them, they're ready to buy the right property today, and and they're prepared to pay a fair and reasonable price for it. So I'd like to think that's reflective of most people in the market. They're not bargain hunters. There's always going to be bargain hunters, opportunists. It's just it's dreaming. Just, I think there's a bit of that yeah. that people are almost willing the market down yeah. because they want to get a bargain. That's right. Even if they yeah. have no yeah. real yeah. rationale to why as well. Yeah. Sometimes, I, yeah, it is been And you're 100%. There will always be those type of buyers in the market. But what, what has happened, and I've had clients that have signed there where they had their pre approval lapse, you know, early in the year, six months pre approval, they've reapplied, and the bank have said, look, I'm sorry, you know, we were prepared to lend you $500,000 late last year, but now, you know, your serviceability, your income hasn't changed, your serviceability requires, needs to be X amount now to service a $500,000 loan, so we're sorry to say we can only lend you $450,000. So unfortunately, those buyers still have got the mindset, oh, well, we were looking at, you know, $800,000 homes, you know, back early January. Now they're looking at the same homes going, oh, we've got 50000 less, so we're going to offer 50000 less on on this. So you just, never, you just end up never buying anything. And that's what I've happens. seen. So big, yeah, you clients be- go through that, especially when the market was going up and they, they sort of just struggled to reconcile in their own mind that that's what the value of it is mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And then they just waited to wait and waited and waited and they probably cost themselves hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially because they were too scared to meet the market if they were genuine about buying and they missed it and then they got the other way, which is sort of the opposite of the fear of missing out. We've (laughs) talked about a lot where people threw threw money at it. And again, I think from personal experience, having you involved, you can can find that value that you go, right, that's a limit. That's what we we think it's worth. Past that, you just walk away and you can't think about it again. But if you're just going on your own and you're sitting around the kitchen table, 
making a decision you don't really know. You're just guessing ultimately and yeah. then you're probably going to miss out or you might end up paying way too much <laughs> as well. I think something that I always remind my clients, we have to run our own race and, and it's like yeah. when they say, oh, look, I've, we've got an offer of this and they're coming back tonight and, you know, we need to know, blah, blah, blah. And you go, well, we, we, we use other competition as you can either go both ways. Get spooked by it. Oh no! You know now we're going to have to pay more because someone else has got either more money or sees more value in it than you do. So you have to be very careful to be too influenced by others. Yeah, that's why it's always you know, whether it's auction, private sale, negotiating. At some point, we've got to walk away. At some point, okay? well, I, think, I think that goes to the point we've spoken about it plenty of times. Ben, on the economy that matters is your own. Your own. Your own. Yep, that's the one that matters. You can be influenced. Hundred percent. And sure. There's a dichotomy there because you've got to actually understand and consider what's going on in the market. But ultimately, the decisions you need you make need to be informed ones based upon your own no circumstances, circumstances, not someone else's. That's got to be the primary influence in any decision making you have. That probably brings us to, I suppose, some call to actions, Tony. So for for people out there, maybe listening to this, they're on either the buying or the selling end of the equation what is your what are your closing comments to them and any calls to action to them if and, and we'll touch on if they wanted to perhaps look you up and engage you whereabouts would they find you so it's a few questions there mate sorry all sure. at once <laughs> so firstly jay well, my advice to vendors no probably different than any at any time is that make sure that you get advice from area specialists mm-hmm. often not I'll have vendors, prospective vendors say to me, oh, I saw Ben Kemp. He sold so many properties in our area. He's he's the most dominant agent. And I'll go, yeah, Ben, yep. Yeah, he's dominant, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, he sells a lot of houses. I don't know whether he's actually the best agent. So there's, there's often a distinct difference between the agent who sells the most properties to those that sell a number of properties but the majority of those properties are in your neighborhood there's a difference i've worked in some offices many offices actually where the most dominant agent selling most of the properties would be the last agent that i would sell my home with because it's just turnover 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 get the numbers get the numbers get the numbers get it done get it done get it done so just be careful to distinguish you know just because an agent selling a lot of properties don't make them any good. One thing with selling, this is something you've I've spoken to you about in the past. People feel like they need to spend money on their home before they sell it to get it in the best possible shape, even though the most likely market for selling it is someone who's going to come along with a bulldozer. So they end up spending <laughs> twenty, thirty grand <laughs> that they exactly. never exactly. see again. And I think a lot of people feel like, like some of my gonna, early problems. We're going to polish this thing up. Yeah. I want it to look great. It's yeah. a bit like the spring thing. Yeah. They go, oh, yeah, we've got to make sure we get, oh, get the new carpet in. The carpet's hideous. But yeah. They don't know who they're trying to sell to. Mm-hmm. It's almost an ego thing, yeah, a reflection of a, themselves. A bit of pro- you know, people have yeah, a bit pride. of that pride in it too. But you've got to sort of separate that and go, who, yeah. well, who's actually going to buy this thing? Correct. And sometimes you do. You yeah, know, it's like getting them styled and you know furniture in them as well, like those little bits and pieces. Yep, I yeah. totally agree. And, and what we're talking, I mean, staging, I think, has been one of the biggest game changers in real estate. The, you know, the stylist and the home styling. I mean, really, because often I'll say to clients, now, let's, we just have to imagine this place empty. What is it going to look like vacant? Even lighting, you know, lamps and everything. That these, Like, let's just go back, private inspection, no one else here. Let's turn all the lights off. Let's turn the power off at the main, because that's what a lot of the agents do now. The houses are empty. They turn every light on in the whole house, turn it off at the main, and then when they arrive at the open for inspection on the Saturday morning, walk in, turn the power on at the main, lights up like a Christmas tree, walk through, oh, how good is this? So I often I'll say to buyers, let's go private inspection, turn every light off and see what it's like. And it's amazing. Tony, clear blue sky outside and this house is dark. Well, there you go. No surprise, every light on was on in the house. So, yeah, staging's been aim changer for, for real estate but just yeah be careful try and imagine as a buyer what that property be like bare bones because could have a big very variation on what you're prepared to pay for and it yeah so. knowing who you're selling it to i think speaking to is a first home buyer is more emotive yep if they're going to see themselves yep. living there how to set it, how to set it up that's right how, yeah. how should we set this house up 
That's right. Yeah, really important. So yeah, so back, so my advice, vendors thinking of selling, just get the right advice from the agents that are doing the business, most of their business in your neighborhood, runs on the board. I think they need to have a level of, of reality about them. You don't want to list an agent that's all doom and gloom, but then you don't want to list an agent that's just giving you, telling you what you want to hear. Oh, the market's fantastic. So, you know, you need to know the good, the bad, and everything in between about how the market is at the moment, and more particularly when I say the market, your neighbourhood, your suburb. Comparable sales, and I know we're running out of time a little bit, but just, you know, don't read into, you know, if, if an agent comes along and says, oh, we only got that for that and that for that, that for that, just use it as a guide, but it's not an ironclad indicator on the reflection that those sales may have on your property. Because trust me, I think I know this better than anybody, behind every sale, there's a reason and a story behind every sale. And I'm talking about a price that's just like, oh my goodness, how on earth did they achieve that? There'll be a reason behind it. Just like there's some you look and you go, gee, that's disappointing. I'm, I'm surprised that, it, you know, that seems like a pretty good buy for someone. There'll be a reason. There's nearly always a reason. And it, it might be. A building that, inspection was that's terrible. Right, correct. That's right. Ben, exactly. A myriad of reasons why. Could be the sold it to a, you know, a good friend and maybe 100 grand might have gone under the table and you know, we, only declared, we declared, you know, the 90% of the purchase price, you know. So, yeah, be careful going too much into the data to make those decisions. Be realistic in your expectations as an owner and the, give the agent, I suppose, the ability to freely tell you the good, the bad, and everything in between. Be quite upfront and say, look, you don't have to sugarcoat this. We need to know. As you said before, Ben, informed decisions. You know, without the feedback, without the good, the bad, and everything in between, you can't make the best decision. So, you know, a lot of agents haven't had to have those conversations for a number of years. Dare I say it, there might be some agents that have never really had to have that conversation with owners. So that's for vendors. For buyers, Pretty much a similar thing. Don't read too much. You know, do what's right for you. If it's the right property, ticks most of the boxes, not going to put you into financial hardship. What are you waiting for? Right, really. Don't gamble on the family home, especially if it's a family home. Obviously, my advice to investors is, is somewhat different, but for homeowners, whether you're upgrading, whether you're downsizing, if it ticks most of the boxes, it's in your budget. Don't be worried about the next interest rate rise too much. Don't be worried about you know what it might be worth in one month, 12 months. Play the long game is what I'd be suggesting you do. And that's what we probably said with our, our clients is it's never, there's never a time you just don't consider entering a market, whether that be shares or property yeah. or anything. Just make sure you know you're good for it and you can manage you know interest rate rises and all the like that goes with it. So I think the worst thing we hear is when people go, oh, I reckon I'll get a better, it'll be cheaper in six months. I, I hate that term. Yeah, and maybe they will, but maybe they won't. And maybe they'll never ever buy. No. Like, no. I mentioned off air, Ben, I helped my young fella buy his first home in Hearn Hill, middle of last year. And the last thing we were thinking about was, you know, like it was just, it is what it is. He was ready to go. He was ready to buy. He knew, had a pretty specific idea on what he was looking for in a home. The right pro property presented itself off market. It was from a property management firm. Uh, they don't sell, but I've done a bit of business with them over the over the years. And, and the agent there, Tiffany, she sent me an email. Hey, Tony, I've got this property. We've been managing it for quite a few years. Landlord just wants to sell it, doesn't want to put it on the market, doesn't want to spend any money, blah, blah, blah. Tenant, there's a lease there until uh, November, October. It's available for sale. This is the price. Can get you through whenever you want. Great. Tee it up. Went up, had a look at it. This is pretty good. Negotiated a, what I thought was a fair price. Done. We went, you know, oh, no, we should wait. Or we should. It was just, it is what it is. Maybe six months later or a year later, it, you know, maybe on paper it's worth a bit less, but you're not selling, not selling. it. It's a long-term it's thing. That's so exactly. That's exactly it doesn't right, matter man. at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how can people engage with you, Tony, specifically? So on the owner-occupier front, on the investment front, how do they do it? How do they get in touch with you and when should they? When they're ready to go. Even if they're not ready to go, even if it's, you know, something that they've been considering for a little while, more than happy, no obligation to come and have a chat to you. You can reach me. Uh, I've got a website, which is uh, www.geelongrealestateadvocates, all right, one word, .com.au. Com. So I've got a website there that, you know, it's pretty comprehensive that, 
the website. Um, you didn't even know you're on LinkedIn. No, so. I didn't even know I was on LinkedIn. <laughs> so you're on LinkedIn. <laughs> thanks, <Real> for, <laughs> thanks, Jay, for bringing that to my attention, and thanks to my good wife Sue for um, for doing that for me. Shout out to Sue. Setting that, setting that for me uh, eleven years ago. Thank you. And or you can give me a call on zero four one eight five two four double one six. More than happy to send out. I'll, I often send out my um, service charter, which explains uh, a little bit more about what we can do to help you. But as I say to everyone, you know, I'm happy to do as little or as much as the client requires me to do. So it's really, as I said, no one size fits all approach. Just happy to help you out. And you mentioned before that you've got some clients that are on your books at the moment awaiting. So investors, you've got uh, owner occupiers. Are you? Do you sit? Is there any preference for you around residential, commercial, rural? Is there any place you don't? Yep. Operating. Uh, yeah. So I'd like, once again, the advice that I give is relative to the market that I'm most active in, which is City Grey Geelong. I still do a bit down Surf Coast, Ballerine, a bit out Golden Plains, but I don't for one moment suggest that I'm an expert in those those areas. So more of my work in those areas is just acquisition only, whereas the clients found the property and say, hey, Tony, help us secure it. But as I said, I do as little or as much, or if you're outside the region, local, and you go, look, we just don't have the time or the inclination to be attending open for inspections, talking with agents, et cetera, et cetera. You can outsource that to me. We meet, we sit down, we fill out the buyer's brief, which clearly defines the search, what it is we're after, pricing our budget, what we're looking for in a property, the the must-haves, the, the would-likes, the must-haves, the non-negotiables, or you know potentially we're prepared to forego on this, 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 and and just trying to, to get you the best, very best property we possibly can. Look, I, I do live my life around location. I think location is just that location's everything. You know, the fundamentals of real estate have always been location, ideally land, but then we we break it down, and, and it still surprises me often where buyers. They won't pick up on things like aspect orientation, like where's the sun come up in the morning? Where's the sun go down at night? Is this property going to be really dark even in summer? Is there connectivity? Is there good connectivity between indoor and outdoor? What you're trying to do with, with a lot of property is future-proof it because let's face it, these days we love, you know, outdoors, you know, barbecue, you know, nothing better than open up the, the doors of the back living room and out to the deck or the courtyard and you know you've got, just got good interaction between indoor and out I think that's a really important aspect of a lot of properties and there are some properties that just don't offer offer that you know the kitchens are at the front of the house bedrooms are at the back you know you've got to walk through the laundry to go outdoors the nursery is so, right next to the main bedroom yeah then. that's right that's, might have yeah. fallen <laughs> <laughs> isn't that a good thing Jay? Yeah. <laughs> less to less distance to travel at 2am in the morning so yeah just you know those things you know can't, what you know? You can't change location. You can make land smaller, but you can't make it bigger. So you know what's important to you in that regard. But I'm a stickler for walking through a home and going, has this, has this got good layout? How hard is it to make it at work? You know, can we change rooms around? Can we open up rooms? Can we bring in some light? Can we get that connectivity between indoor and outdoors? And there's some properties you just go, oh, just not going to work. So I try and make all those things. I like to bring those things to my client's attention that they may not even have thought about before. So I was talking to you about the, the lighting, you know, hey, middle of summer and every light's on and turn it off and you go, how dark is this house, you know? And like it's like the clearest day for the year outside, not a cloud in the sky and it's a dark house. And you go, oh, well, there you go. So, oh, yeah, the, we talk about styling and, and staging, you know, uh, scented candles, you know, all those things. What is that possibly camouflaging? You try um, to be the ultimate skeptic. On skeptic yeah, you yeah, can. Yeah, but you just don't. Yeah, you that's don't what I'm know. saying. You just, you know, the, yeah. I walk into home, some home and you go, oh my goodness, you know, it's like being in a spa in Bali, you know, yeah. and you go, wow, wow, you know, smells really good, but yeah, I wonder why they're putting on so many candles, you know, every room, and you know, those things you plug into the PowerPoints, and you go, yeah, maybe there's. Yeah, something a bit more sinister going on here that we can't smell. So, but just, yeah, look, just seek out it. As I said, I'm happy to take your calls, let me know. And look, as I said right from the outset, I don't have all the answers, but I think something I pride myself on, just like you guys in your industry, is you know, if you don't have the answers, you've got 
great connections, great source of colleagues, other business owners, operators, you know, through your experience and, and obviously your vast network of associations that you can you can get those answers. And I, and I think that every bit of advice that I give is unbiased and I'll always give you my thoughts, but then I'll always give you thoughts and feedback of, of others that perhaps may have a bit more intimate understanding of a particular property so once again so they can make far more informed decisions and, and that's really what it is isn't it you, no different to you guys you know informed you just, decisions informed and decisions yeah. and, that, and that's and that's it and ultimately you know you, you take on board my recommendations or you don't you're not going to offend me it's, it's, I tell you I've been offended enough I've been offended enough <laughs> I've been offended enough over the years uh, I've stopped worrying about being offended I can tell you so that being able to to have someone in your corner that allows you to be more rational and objective at emotional times, I think is pretty important. And uh, that's where I think the crossover with what you do and what we do as financial advisors, it's a pretty common theme. It's it's really dealing with human nature and the fact that we are all we're emotional beings and it is very helpful to have someone that can actually be in your corner and see that the scented candles are I'm asking something. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we better wrap it up now, Tony. Mate, thanks heaps for coming on the podcast. I uh, really you. enjoyed the chat. Likewise. I'm sure that everyone that's listening will get a significant amount out of that. Uh, we'll pop all of your contact details uh, in the show notes. Ben, did you want to say anything in closing before we wrap uh, it up? I think I always enjoy talking to you about the property stuff. And I think a lot of people are just fascinated by it and all the little subplots and the games and things that get played. So I think this would be a popular one. So. Thanks for coming in. Good on you, Ben. Thanks Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thanks, Tony. Cheers. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, business should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorized representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.